Hello, and welcome to Mel Make Stuff. My name is Melissa, and this is episode 16. I want to start off by thanking everyone who commented on my last episode, letting me know how it is that you found my videos. I'm always a little curious about how people are getting here, and it turns out that it's largely recommendations from other wonderful podcasters. So everyone who is mentioned in that comment section, I am going to list in the show notes right down below this video. Please go ahead and check them out in case there's anybody there that you're not familiar with. You might want to go ahead and, and give them a try if they're new to you. It's been a little while since I last recorded, and part of the reason for that is that I have taken a little bit of a screen break over the last two months. I have really not been watching a whole lot of YouTube, and this sort of stemmed from a realization that I had that I was losing the ability to really critically listen and remember information. Uh, like I was having trouble listening and retaining information from audio podcasts or audiobooks. And so I wanted to sort of take the summer away from staring at screens to really try to redevelop that that sense of hearing and, and comprehension. And so I feel a little bit out of the loop. Like I have no idea what other people have been doing. I have no idea what like the cool knitting patterns are right now, but um, maybe that means that there will be some unusual things coming up in the near future on this channel. So let's get into today's content. I have two finished objects for you. I have three works in progress and also a little bit of spinning at the end for anybody who might be interested in that. The first finished object I have for you is the Willowwood by Caitlin Hunter. This sweater came out of the winter 2018 edition of Pom Pom Magazine, which was edited by Nora Gone. There are a bunch of other projects in here that I wanna make. And I am pretty happy with how this came out. I made a yarn substitution. So the yarn suggested in the pattern is the Wool Folk 4, which is a chain at wool. And it was just a little bit out of my price range for the time I was looking to start this project. And so what I ended up using is the Lana Grossa Landlust, which is, this is the 180. I think they also have a 120 that is a thicker weight, like a, a bulky weight. This is a worsted weight. I would say maybe light-ish worsted weight. And it's also a chainette. And I'm pretty happy with this as a sub for the Wool Folk. So the Wool Folk is absolutely beautiful. Go ahead and buy it if you are down to spend that kind of money um, on a project like this. I wasn't totally sure how much I would love the finished object, but I actually really like how it looks on. So let me show you. You can see that this is quite cropped. I am wearing it with an extremely high-waisted pair of pants. These are some new Persephone pants that I recently made. I did size down from the last pair that I made. I still think they're a little bit too big, but whatever. I like this high-waisted pant with a sweater this cropped. I think I would definitely need to wear high-waisted something with this sweater. You can easily add length to the sweater. It is a bottom-up construction for the body, so you could just add a little bit more length there if you didn't want it quite so cropped. That would be a pretty easy mod. I think I talked a little bit about this in the last episode, but I was not getting row gauge on this project, so my row gauge was actually smaller than recommended. So for the body, I just knit to the length that I wanted and just measured it by length. For the sleeves, I had a little bit of a dilemma because I usually have to shorten sleeves a lot, um, but because I had that smaller row gauge, I didn't think I was gonna have to shorten them in this instance. And in fact, I actually had to lengthen them just a little bit. I added just a couple of rows right above the bobble section. So basically right in the middle of the upper arm and that was the only modification I made. I don't think it really made that much of a difference, honestly, but it made me feel better at the time. The showstopper of this garment is obviously the sleeves. They are incredible. I love the huge bobbles and also the really bold color work, which I think worked very well in the chainette yarn. I wasn't sure how cohesive the color work was going to look, but I actually really like it. It does make the fabric at those color work areas extremely thick. So that's just something to consider. This isn't a sweater that I'm really gonna be wearing until it gets cooler for sure because of that. I made an unintentional modification, which was uh, there's a three needle bind off for the shoulder and the pattern has it written to have the seam exposed on the outside, which I think is a really nice touch. And I just wasn't paying attention at that point. And unfortunately, didn't do it. I did a regular three needle bind off with the seam on the inside. And by the time I realized it, I had almost the whole collar done and I wasn't going to go back. But I do think that that's a really cool detail on the original pattern. It's like a small thing, but it's subtle. And I would do that seam on the outside if I were to make this sweater again. So I don't know that 
I will do that. There's a lot of things in the queue, but you know. This is a discontinued yarn, but it was only recently discontinued, so I think you can still get these particular colors if you search for them. Uh, this one is number 227. It is like a really nice caramel color. I don't remember the actual name um, of the of the color. You know, sometimes shops will give these colorway names, but go by the number. So this is 227 if you're looking for this one. And this is just the regular white, which is color 201. So that is Willowood by Caitlin Hunter. The other finished object I have for you today is what I'm wearing, which is the Mika slipover. You might remember from the last episode that I made a big modification to this in terms of my yarn choice. So the, the yarn substitution that I made is one that was a little bit out there. The original pattern is written for a wool, a nice woolly wool. And what I used is a chainette linen. So definitely the other side of the spectrum from what is recommended. And so that was a risk. And I think that it was one well worth taking. So what this has resulted in is sort of a nice summer top. It definitely is a little bit see-through. I was planning on wearing it without anything underneath. And as soon as I put it on to start this video, I was like, oh, you can see everything underneath there. That's cool. So I did put on a camisole underneath. And I think that's probably the way I will wear it unless it's like blisteringly hot, which... Thankfully, we're just now coming out of that period of weather here in central Massachusetts. So hopefully that's it for the year. So while this pattern might have been originally intended to be worn sort of as a fall t-shirt or maybe over a collared shirt or something like that in a more traditional like slipover fashion, what this yarn substitution has done is allowing me to just wear it as like a cap sleeve top, which I know is not necessarily to everybody's taste, but I like um, emphasizing the broadness of my shoulders. I, I find it, it sort of balances out the rest of my body. And so I like a little bit of a, a wider sleeve that comes, you know, to somewhere in here will tend to look good on me, in my opinion. Um, you can see that the armhole is a little bit low. I think last episode I had not done the hems, if I recall correctly, I hadn't done the sleeve, the turn hems for the sleeve. And so I was a little bit worried that the armhole was going to be way, way, way too big. It's a little big. Um, my bra, I think, would still be covered just barely by, by the top if I was not wearing a camisole underneath. So that uh, might actually have more to do with my yarn choice than the pattern, honestly, because the linen is going to drape more than the wool that was recommended. I love the turned hem for the shoulders. So for the shoulders, she has you do a pico hem and you sew it down on the inside. And I really loved that detail. That was one of the things that made me want to make this top in the first place. The other thing that made me want to make this originally were these lace patterns, which are, again, sort of a little bit obscured because of my yarn choice, but I still like the emphasis of these sort of hard lace patterns here. It, it makes it seem almost like a, like a piece of armor, like a breastplate. I think I mentioned that last week and I like that effect. The neckline is also a turned hem, but no pico this time, just a regular, um, I think she actually has you do like a slip one, knit one, something like that around the neck for that turning row. Usually when you have a, a hem like this on, on a neckline or wherever, you would do maybe a pearl round here or pearl row and then flip it to the inside and then you would have a sort of a ridge and what she has you do is just slightly different and that was a nice nice thing to do nice thing to try you can see the body of the garment ends up being in reverse stockinette on the outside which is another nice thing this is written to be top down and i ended up flipping the body inside out at this point so that i could just knit instead of pearl in the round and then we have some half twisted rib on the bottom so in a fully twisted one by one rib you would knit through the back loop and pearl through the back loop around this way you just knit through the back loop and that's the one that shows on the front as twisted. And then on the back, you just do a regular pearl as you're going around, but on the back, it um, it ends up being a normal looking knit column, which you can see there. It's a little bit more user friendly than doing fully twisted rib when you're not gonna see the inside of the rib anyway, you know? Regarding the pattern, I didn't find it to be written in a very idiomatic way. Like it's definitely an indie pattern where it, it doesn't necessarily follow like standard pattern writing style. And there are, 
some errors in the pattern, which were easy to catch. It was like things like you, it would tell you to purl when you were very clearly supposed to be knitting whatever the, the row was. It's something that could trip you up if you're a little bit newer. So I would maybe save this pattern if you're more like intermediate. There's nothing difficult to do here. It's just, um, if you feel confident in your ability to, to notice the, those types of mistakes and sort of pick them out, go for it. If you are one of those people who really likes following the patterns to the letter of the law, maybe save it for a little bit later. So that is my finished Mika slipover. The first work in progress that I have to talk to you about today is the Nerides, which is from this issue of Pom Pom. It's like a little bit of a continuation of the Pom Pom extravaganza from last time. Here is what the design looks like. It's a lace top made with the pattern calls for two strands of mohair and one strand of linen fingering weight. And while that might give a lot of very interesting possibilities for doing like color combos, like really cool subtle color combos using three strands of yarn, um, making a top with two strands of mohair held together was going to be a little bit, again, a little bit too pricey for just what I was wanting for this particular project. And I talked about this in the last episode, but what I had decided to do was hold a heavier weight linen together with one strand of mohair and see what sort of effect I could get and also to see if I can get gauge. So you might remember this was my swatch from last time and I had combined the darker blue mohair with like a lighter silvery uh, base yarn and there was just too much contrast here and it was looking marled. So I had said I was gonna choose a different uh, base yarn for that. I did end up doing that and swatching, still getting gauge. So I went with this, uh, I think I showed it last week. It's the Euroflex linen. And here is how my swatch looks. So this is a big difference here in terms of um, the definition, just because you can tell, uh, you can see the stitches a little bit better due to the fact that it's not marled looking like this one. This is the Euroflex, which I think they say is a sport weight. And this is the mohair, which is knitting for olive in the dark, deep petroleum blue. I think that's the colorway. So you can see they're, they are a very close match. And here is what this is looking like so far. So I have done a lot of work on this. I actually did most of the work on this right after we last talked. And then it got so hot and humid here. Like usually there are maybe three weeks where it's just so humid that I cannot touch mohair any longer. And so those those three weeks happen to coincide with me starting this project. And of course the other mohair project that I have going. But I've basically got the body done. It is a bottom up pattern. And let me talk you through the construction of this because I, like I do, made a modification almost immediately. So the pattern is supposed to begin with an I-cord cast on. And as you can maybe tell here, I have a provisional cast on here. So I do not like doing I-cord cast-ons because the way that the I-cord cast-on is constructed, that first round that you knit or row that you knit after doing an I-cord cast-on always just looks too loose to me. Uh, and it has to do with the way the I-cord is formed. I saw a good video about this a while ago. I think it might've been a Suzanne Bryan video. If I can find it, I'll link it below. I was trying to figure out ways to make an I-cord cast on look good. And it's just, I, I did a little bit of experimenting and I didn't like how it was looking. So I decided, you know what? I will just do a provisional cast on, which I always use the crochet provisional cast on with just some scrap yarn. And then that gets removed later on. The provisional cast on will give me the opportunity to experiment with that later on. Like if I start doing an I-cord bind off, which is my, my plan now, is once I get to the finishing stage, I'll put all of these stitches back on my needle and just do an I-cord bind off. If it ends up that it's sort of flipping one way or another, or I don't like it for whatever reason, I can at that point just go back and do like a rib or, you know, some other sort of finishing edge for the bottom. And I don't have to screw around with trying to cut off an I-cord cast on that I want to change at the end of the project, you know. Regarding the stitch patterns for this project, there are two lace charts that are used and they sort of alternate as you go around the body. So we first have this chart here, which is, uh, I've seen this referred to as a bumblebee chart. If you Google bumblebee chart, um, you'll, you'll see what 
looks very similar to this. And then there's also these sort of little separation lines of lace that go between each bumblebee repeat. And so we have these two charts that just repeat around and around. And that seems simple, except this chart, this little separation chart is eight rows or rounds long. And this bumblebee chart, the way the designer has chosen to put it in this pattern is actually only seven rows tall, seven rows per repeat. And so when you have an eight row chart and a seven row chart, what ends up happening is that it's a little bit tricky to, to keep track of that. And I understand why this designer did that because if you had two eight row charts that were just um, following each other, you know, you were always doing row one, row two, row three on, on each chart as you went around. What you end up with is sort of very subtle horizontal lines. It's almost more of like a, a feeling that you get from the garment that it's more regimented. And so what having one chart as eight rows and one chart as seven is sort of creates this like undulating effect to the fabric that's extremely subtle, but also part of the appeal of this garment. The way that I usually keep track of things like this, anything where I'm following multiple charts is to just make like a checklist and just check off which row or which round I'm doing. So with the lower body of the sweater being knit in the round, it's not really that hard to keep track of that. However, once you get to the underarm, you stop knitting in the round and you start knitting back and forth. So you have a right side and a wrong side. At that point, the seven row bumblebee chart changes to a 14 row chart, which is not given in the pattern. <laughs> So it is written out like the 14 row, they have both written and charted uh, lace charts and lace patterns in this magazine, but the 14 row chart is not shown. It's only written. So what ends up happening is the rows. So when you're knitting in the round, everything's a right side row, but once you get to that armhole split, you end up doing during those rows eight to 14 of the bumblebee repeat, you end up doing the rows that you were previously doing on the right side. You end up doing some of them on the wrong side. I hope that makes sense. Um, and the important one is the row across the top of the little bumblebee wing. So this one here, the way that this, like this row here is sort of where all the action happens. You end up casting on using a backwards loop cast on some stitches here, and then you, you end up pulling some strands up and then you cast on some more stitches. And so what happens all of a sudden, once you're knitting back and forth is that, you know, you used to be doing these backward loop cast on stitches on the right side. And now on the second repeat, you're doing them on the wrong side. And it matters which backward loop cast on you choose. So the one that I wanted to use is this one here, which looks very clean across the top of the, this little wing here on the right side. This is the backward loop cast on where the yarn ends up at the back of your work after you have created the loop. And so when I was doing this swatch, I had in my mind, like I was aware that this was going to be something to think about. And I had thought, you know, maybe when I'm doing it on the wrong side, I, that means that I then need to flip it and do the backwards loop cast on that ends up with the yarn coming out of the front of the work. But that, as you can see, didn't really work. It, it doesn't match this one. And it actually uh, sort of closes off the top of these little wings. And I really didn't want that. I want them all to be open and looking like this. And so what I had discovered as I was knitting here on my project is that doing the backwards loop cast on where the yarn ends up pointing out the back of your work will look the same on the right side or the wrong side. So that is the one that I ended up using. So you can see here's my armhole split down here. And so the pattern down here is all knit in the round. And then up here, it is knit flat. And I can't see much of a difference there. So I'm happy with this. There is then a little bit of shaping 
short row shaping for the shoulder, which <laughs> blessedly uh, you only do a little bit of decreasing for the, the neckline and then it, you get to stop doing this pattern and you just do some uh, fully twisted rib. And then you do the same on the front with a little bit of a lower neckline there. And then I think there's a three needle bind off. The sleeves I believe are picked up and then knitted down. I am a little bit apprehensive about how that's gonna be because I have short arms and because like just the sleeve shape on this sweater is a little odd. I don't know if it's gonna be flattering. I suspect it probably won't be. Uh, it might make my arms look even shorter than they are. I'm gonna play that by ear a little bit and see if I like how it's turning out. The good thing about knitting sleeves that way where you, you sew the body together and then you pick up the sleeves and knit down is that I can just rip it right out without a problem if I decide that I wanna change it in some way. Yeah, I mean, this sleeve shape, I don't know. It's, it's really pretty, but I just don't know about it. And getting the length right is gonna be very important there because this is not a sleeve that you wanna to be too long because you're never gonna be able to do anything while you're wearing the sweater. You know, you won't be able to eat, you won't be able to uh, you know, put dishes in the dishwasher or whatever. So we'll see when I get there. The next work in progress I have to share is the Plumetie by Julie Knits in Paris. This is from the same issue of Pom Pom as the last project. And here is what it looks like, just to refresh your memory. It is, uh, the entire body is knitted with a single strand of mohair and then we have a contrast collar, cuffs, and hem. The two yarns that I am using are the Pearl Soho Tussock, which I will put the colorway down below, can't remember it at the moment, and then I have some Malabrigo Sock that I am using for the collar and cuffs and hem. And here is where I am so far. So I have the entire body done and the collar, which I am obsessed with. <laughs> and at this point, I am sort of debating leaving the sleeves off. There's something about this color that I think, I don't know, I'm just really feeling like this might be a really cute sort of sleeveless thing over a long dress or over something else. And putting the sleeves on is going to make it sort of extremely dramatic. I don't know, I'm just getting a feeling that I wanna leave the sleeves off, so I might, although it's really gonna take some finagling to finish these armholes if I'm making a modification like that. Let me talk you through. I think I had gotten, I had the hem and I had started the body the last time we talked, I believe. And so this is constructed very similarly to the last one. It's bottom up, then you split at the armhole, you start knitting back and forth. I actually found knitting with the single strand of mohair to not really be as uncomfortable as I thought it was going to. I definitely used a wooden needle so that it was less slippery and that the mohair had something to sort of grab onto. And that really is a game changer. I would not try to knit a single strand of mohair on a metal needle if you are finding that you're struggling with that. Um, switching to a bamboo needle or, or wooden needle of whatever type, um, give it a try, see if it is a little easier. And the shoulders are finished with a three needle bind off, which looks pretty clean, considering that this is a really see-through um, situation here. That three needle bind off is really nice. And then you pick up and do the collar. And so I was really worried about how fiddly picking stitches up off of this mohair was gonna be because if we look at the armhole, I'll give you sort of a taste of what picking stitches, picking up stitches off of this would be like. It's just like so open <laughs> uh, because the, the body is knit at a significantly uh, bigger gauge than, than how you're gonna be knitting this collar. And I was like, God, how's that gonna work? But the way that it's described in the pattern is extremely clear. Uh, down to like how how many stitches you need to pick up and and like sort of how to pace yourself through it and it really wasn't a problem at all I was expecting to sort of have to think about that a little bit more than I had to and so the way the collar is constructed is how's the best way to show this to you okay let me stand up so you picked up these stitches around the neckline and then you, the first thing you did is knit an I cord, which you can see just there. 
So you knit this I cord. Here you can see at the back just what it looks like coming off of that, the mohair. It's a really, really pleasing finish. So you pick up the stitches for the neck and you do that I cord around the entire neckline. There is a keyhole at the back. So eventually that will be how the back neckline is finished with a little button here, which I happen to have a nice match in my stash. <laughs> it's a little hard to show you guys this, but found this one in my stash. So that is gonna be what I will use at the back neck. And so then at that point, and they don't show this as an option in the magazine, but it's actually a really nice clean finish to just have the I-cord on there. There are a couple of projects on Ravelry where the person did the I-cord and just stopped and you have just a very clean finish. You still have that keyhole at the back neck, which is a nice detail. But then, you know, if this collar isn't to your taste, which I completely understand because it's a very specific look, um, you don't have to put this on at all. And it just creates a very nice uh, sort of clean, more modern finish. Uh, I could actually see making this again with that finish instead of, of this little collar. But if you are making the collar, what you then do is go around that I cord. And again, the designer explains very clearly like exactly how far to go when you're picking up your stitches and the number of stitches that she has you pick up for doing the I cord corresponds like exactly to the number of stitches that you need to pick up. Like there's no sort of futzing around. It's like a one for one. You pick up one stitch on the I cord per one stitch on the collar. And again, that was like a low stress thing that I thought was going to be harder th than it was. Then you start knitting your collar pieces. You can see that the collar is then shaped with increases, which you can see here. They are mirrored on the other side, so it's nice and symmetrical on, on the other collar. And then you have this little frill, which I just love. <laughs> it's really delicate. It actually sort of looks like crochet, but it is not. It's knitted. And... So after I had done this, it was really flipping up a lot. I took a little video here uh, this morning to show you because I, I was like, oh, I don't know uh, how easy it's going to be to show if I don't try to do something about this, this flipping up before I start recording. And what I ended up doing was actually steaming the, the collar. So I haven't blocked this yet or anything, uh, but I ended up steaming the collar just with my iron and I used my tailor's ham to shape the collar a little bit. So if you've never seen a tailor's ham before, this is this is what it looks like. It's hard. Um, I mean, it's stuffed with something. Uh, I can squ squish it a little bit, but it, it's quite hard. And this is a, a wonderful ironing tool. I bought this online for, you know, $15 maybe. And this is super useful anytime you need to, to iron something that's not flat. Um, and so for this collar, I just placed it on the ham and then steamed it, pressed it into place just with my hand. I didn't actually touch the iron to the collar at all. I just sort of pressed it into place and then I let it cool still on the ham. Like I just, you know, made sure it was in the shape I wanted. And then I walked away for a couple seconds and came back and that seemed to really work. So that is uh, the deal with this. This Malabrigo, I don't think has any nylon in it. I would still probably use my iron. Um, even if I was using a fingering weight, like a, a regular sock yarn that had nylon, I would maybe just test it on my swatch first. Uh, or like, you just have to be okay if something's gonna happen and you don't test it out first, right? I do frequently steam block things. Um, not every single thing that I own, but I'm not afraid to steam block using my iron. It's just something that you have to be a little bit careful with if you're not sure how the particular fiber is gonna re react. I wouldn't use it if there was anything metallic or, or anything like that. Maybe a, a much cooler setting or I don't know. It, it would really depend at that point, but like normal wools, it's generally going to be okay. Especially if you're not like touching the surface of the iron to the wool. So as far as finishing the sleeve opening now, I think what I would like to do is just try to do another I cord around the sleeve openings. And then we'll see what it looks like on. What I am wondering is if the top of the garment will sort of drape too far over my shoulder for the proportion that I'm looking for. It's sort of one of those things where I only know it when I see it, whether it's in the right spot. 
And so I think what I will do is put that button on the back neck so I can really fully button the neck. I will do some eye cord on the sleeves. And then if it's still draping a little bit too far over my shoulder, I will either do like sew a stitch like by hand to gather the shoulder so that it sits a little bit higher up. Or I could create like a sort of epaulette little thing, like knit a little strip and sort of button it. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I might have to experiment a little bit. I did size down from the size that's recommended for my bust. So I am a 35 inch bust. I think I would have made the second size if I was going with the recommended amount of ease. So I sized down, but it's still, there's quite a few inches of positive ease built into this pattern. So that's why I'm not like quite sure where that shoulder is gonna hit once I have this on. So getting the motivation to figure that out might take me a little while, but I hope to have that done by the next time we talk. So with these two mohair projects going on in the hottest part of the summer here, it had gotten to the point where I needed something else cast on that was sort of just more of a normal wool, like not something that was going to stick to my sweat. And so I decided to cast something on. I also needed something simple. I've got a bunch of other projects going on right now, but all of them are either color work, so they're really heavy, I didn't want them in my lap, or they've got a more complicated stitch pattern, something I didn't want to deal with when I was going to a knitting group, or I'm taking an online class right now. And so I just wanted something like a little bit more simple to work on during those times. And of course, then I ended up just blowing through almost the entire thing. Uh, so let me show it to you. This is another sweater from the beautiful Shetland Trader book by Gudrun Johnson, which you might remember I made this sweater, the Vair, very recently. And this one that I am now making is Boona Berry. Here is what this looks like. And you can see it's got all of the things that we loved about the Vare, the cropped body. It's got, uh, there are actually two options for the neck here. So this is a turtleneck option. There's also a crew neck option. Uh, it's pretty close fitting in the bust and the upper arm. And then we have these voluminous sleeves, which, you know, this is basically just the sleeve podcast at this point. There are a couple different options for color work choices. So you have this one, which is very sort of graphic. And then over here, here we have uh, a little bit more of a traditional fair aisle pattern, which I find hard to see in the colors that were chosen for this sample, but you can see it a little bit better. This is the, the pattern that I chose, so you'll be able to see it a little bit better on mine. And then uh, this model is also wearing the crew neck version. I'm undecided on whether I'm gonna do the crew neck or not, but I am about to have to figure that out. So I have to decide that quite quickly. So here is how far I've gotten. <laughs> it's almost, it's almost done. <laughs> I've gotten one sleeve basically done. And this has just flown off the needles. This yarn is a dark charcoal. Uh, gray color. It is some Cascade 220 fingering, which is a very affordable yarn if you are in the States at least. Um, it's blowing out because the sun just decided to come out, but there we go. Um, it's a really, it's a dark charcoal. Oh man, that's bright. Okay, let's go camera. Uh, so I have had that yarn in my stash for a long, long time. And the reason I haven't used it is because it's just sort of hard to figure out how to use dark yarn I guess really unless you're doing simple garments or color work it's you know you can incorporate it there but if you are trying to make things that have stitch patterns on them it can feel like why am I doing this much work when it's really hard to see it in the finished garment uh, it really just depends on the stitch pattern I think but for something that's basically a plain body which is the situation here I figured this would be perfect and then I could choose some color work colors that would really pop so hopefully here you can see the detail it's you know it's a very traditional uh, x x and o you know shetland style pattern there with a couple of smaller peris and i have chosen five different colors to be using there and so you can really see how the color choice can can sort of emphasize certain features of the pattern versus others. Looking at that same pattern here, you can see down the middle of this X and O 
motif, there's a much lighter color that's been put in there, and we sort of have this red down the very middle of the of the motif, which is, you know, it's, it is common to have sort of a pop color down the very middle. But having that lighter background color down the middle of this stripe just makes it sort of look like a stripe, right? It really changes the the overall feeling of the, the pattern itself. And what I wanted to try to do was to choose something that was a little bit darker for that section as opposed to light. So here is a close-up of what mine looks like. And it's actually so much darker that it's sort of hard to tell, but it's a, it's a dark like purplish red there. And I also chose that because I figured that that would really help these teal colors that are the main colors that I chose for the, the overall look. Um, pairing those against like a dark purple was gonna help it continue to pop through this section. And I really like this effect that I'm getting here. I'm using an orange as my pop color. This is actually some leftover from my half and half triangles wrap, which I did in the original color. This is like that rust color. Um, I had originally tried using a much brighter pop for that, that those couple of pop rows in this motif, and it was too much, so I, I went back. So these are my five colors I chose. I have a light. These are an assortment of colorwork yarns. Um, some of them are Jameson style yarns. I have a Marie Wallen left over here. This is the one uh, from my half and half triangles wrap. I think this one is Biche Bouche. I wound this off a full skein, hoping to only be able to, to use a little bit of it for this sweater. So these are my, my colors and I hope they're coming across clearly on camera. It's really teal. I wanted the effect to be like this dark charcoal gray and teal to be sort of the, the main palette and then just have these you know, the blue and the orange and the um, the purple to be accompaniments. For construction, this is again knitted from the bottom up. There is a little bit of side shaping, which let's see if you can see it. Yeah, so here you can see there's side shaping. Um, the waist is the smallest part and that increases as you go up towards the bust. Then you do some armhole shaping here and neck shaping like normal. The bottom is knitting around. You knit flat from here up. You could easily add a steek for the armhole if you wanted to and steek it. Um, and then when you come to pick up the sleeve, this is again where, like the Vare, you pick up and this is a set-in sleeve that is done using the, um, the Elizabeth Doherty top-down set-in sleeve method and you shape the sleeve cap and then you immediately start doing some increases which you can see well maybe not immediately there's a uh, for for as written there's a couple of inches i think depending on your size before you start doing increases i started doing them pretty quickly because like normal i I'm having to shorten the sleeves. And so that is complicated in this project by the fact that again, I'm not getting row gauge, but this time my row gauge is too long. And it's not really bad. Like it's, I think the gauge is like 27 stitches and 40 rows in the pattern. And I'm getting 27 stitches in like 38-ish rows. So it's not a whole lot out. Like I wouldn't try to switch needle sizes to try to to change that because then my stitch gauge is gonna to be too too small. It's not such a problem unless you're dealing with something like armhole shaping. So the amount of rows with the way that these top down set in sleeves work, there's a, a proportion based on the number of rows on the body and the number of stitches you pick up here that help to shape this sleeve cap once you get to it. So it can be a little bit complicated to try to figure that out if your row gauge is really different from what is prescribed in the pattern. Mine was not so different that it was gonna make such a big difference. I did end up cutting out a couple of rows here in the upper chest area, but then it was only a few. And so when I got to the point of picking up the stitches for the sleeve, I just sort of fudged it. So. I picked up the same amount of stitches as the pattern recommends for my size. I just didn't have like the ratio of the rows 
on the body to the stitches that I was picking up on the sleeve wasn't quite perfect, but it's fine. Uh, I think the sleeve, especially once this is blocked, it's a little wrinkled now because it's been jammed in a project bag, but once that's blocked, I think it's gonna look okay. So for the sleeve, that's where this row gauge thing comes into play again, because not only do I have short arms, but with my row gauge being long, I needed to figure out a way to, to really shorten this. And so I was not in the mood to try to figure that out when I was working on this initially. And what I decided to do was just start knitting with the recommended amount of rows between increases on the sleeve or rounds in this case, because we're knitting the round. And I would just figure it out later. And so what that resulted in is uh, some increases that are closer together at the end than at the beginning. So if I wanted to be, you know, super fanatical about this, I would have determined the amount of rows that I needed based on my gauge and then divided up the the rows so that I was increasing evenly as I went down the sleeve, but like honestly, whatever, it's fine. Like the ver to create this big volume at the bottom of the sleeve here, there are increases both on the bottom and the top of the sleeve. And you can just barely see those, especially since this yarn is just a little bit heathered. Uh, I can't see those increases at all really. And then you get to this color work and from this point on the sleeve is straight. You're not doing any increasing or decreasing in this area. And so that is my color work. I had calculated how much room I was going to need uh, in order to have a cuff of some length on the bottom. Because if you remember, like looking at the ver, when I was shortening the sleeve, I didn't want to cut all the length off the bottom cuff. And so I had taken some off the upper arm and some off the cuff. And I ended up with like a, a proportional looking, what I determined to be proportional looking sleeve. And so I had done the same for this sleeve. I didn't actually need to shorten it all that much uh, in order to fit that cuff in. But once I got to this point where I am right now, I tried it on. And I actually sort of like the sleeve at this length as a bell sleeve. And so what I'm considering doing now is just doing an I-cord bind off and having this be the end of the sleeve. I don't know if that's a great idea. Right now it's hitting me right about here, maybe a little longer. If that ends up stretching out at all, having a bell sleeve that's like too long is a real pain. I don't like having stuff around my hands that make it so I can't use my hands very well. Um, so I think we'll see, I'll try it on one sleeve, but first I need to do a neckline on this thing so that I know that the sleeve length is gonna be in the, the place that it will be when I'm actually wearing the garment. Right now with no neckband being on this thing, the neck is a little bit stretched out and so the sleeve might be, might look like it's too long if I were to go by the length that it is right now. So I think I'm gonna do a crew neck on this. That's what I'm feeling right now. I really like turtlenecks, but I don't always tend to go for them, uh, especially something that is so similar to the Vare in terms of the shape that I have. It might be nice to have one that's a crew neck. So I'm leaning toward the crew neck right now. So that is my Boona Berry by Gooder Johnston. I will definitely be showing you that one again next time. And I think the next episode might just be like a color work extravaganza if you're down for that. I have the Marie Wallen knit along about finished. I just need to put buttons on it and decide what I'm gonna do with like the sewing down steaks finishing. I have my Ralph sweater from the Vintage Shetland Project book. The body on that is almost done uh, and that has been a real project. You guys have not seen that for a long time so I don't blame you if you don't remember that, uh, but I will show that next time. And if there's any interest, let me know in the comments below. I can show you how I keep my color work yarns. I have like a, a specific way that I organize my stash for swatching and, and deciding what colors to use together. And so if you're interested, I can show you that next time. So let me know in the comments. 
In the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to talk briefly about some spinning that I've been doing, which is another thing that I tend to do once the weather gets hot. I don't know what it is. I just want to spin like in the, the middle of summer. It doesn't make any sense. But if you are not interested in spinning, I will see you next time. And if you are, should only be a few more minutes. I just want to show you this because once I start the project with it, I think it will be a little bit more interesting if you have seen sort of the background of actually spinning these yarns. For this spinning project, I decided that I wanted to do sort of a, a bigger scale, like a large scale project, where I would do a gradient from one color and sort of move through to another unrelated color on the other side. And when you're spinning and sort of combining colors that are on the opposite sides of the color wheel, it can get a little bit dicey in the middle, which is right where I'm at right now, so uh, you'll get to see that. And this idea for this project is based off of something in this book, which is A New Spin on Color by Alana Wilcox. This is a beautiful book if you are a spinner or are interested in maybe learning to spin someday, or even if you're just interested in color. There's a lot of really interesting combinations in this book, and she does things with hand-dyed fiber that I, I hadn't considered before. You know, it's, I'm not uh, such a planner when it comes to spinning. And so usually I'll just go ahead and spin, spin a braid of fiber, you know, however it comes. And I don't really think about planning for larger scale projects. The project that I am doing is modeled off of a project that she did and knit a sweater out of. So here is a photo of the sweater. She did a gradient from yellow to purple and then knit a sweater with it. And this is, I mean, this is bold, right? This is a project here, which is pretty cool. I mean, the concept is cool, you know? And here is what her braids look like. So you can see the, the different types of colors that were incorporated in this project. And so the way that she describes moving from one color to the next is combining them in certain ways. So it's a series of two ply yarns, two singles plied together, and you have, you know, colors A, B, C, D, etc. For some of the plies, you are holding a piece of color A and color B, a piece of the fiber together, and then feeding that into the wheel, spinning those together. So it sort of marls them into one single, and then you spin the accompanying single of just color A or just color B. And I can go into that more if people are interested. Honestly, I'll probably just do a separate spinning video if I ever do a project like this again to really go into detail on, on how I'm doing the combining. But it's really working to move through these colors. So here is a photo of my color array. I am trying to go from like a dark pink purple to dark green. And really combining those colors can be really tricky. And here is how it's going so far. Right here on my desk. So here you can see is the darkest purple. I started with the purples, purple pinks, and I'm just moving through. So with seven braids of fiber, I'm going to end up with 14 50 gram skeins approximately. And so here are the first seven. And you can see, you know, as it moves through, like this one braid that's very clearly hot pink, I was really not sure how or whether that was going to even be able to sort of combine in a way that would morph across colors, and it totally is. And now here we're getting into the greens. And so for this one, the fiber that we're sort of transitioning to has green and pink in it. And so what can happen often, and you can see it happening a little bit here, is that we have some gray happening. And there's no gray in any of this fiber, but the combination of colors that are sort of across from each other on the color wheel can end up uh, graying out the effect of the overall skein. So like if I were to get up really close, you can see there's blues and greens and pinks. And, but from further away, it just looks a little bit softer, a little bit more pastel. And so I'm hoping that we can, as we move now into the greens more, more definitively, that we won't get a whole big section of gray in the middle here, but we'll see how that ends up turning out.
My plan for these is to use them in some sort of very simple project. I'm thinking a finder fade, like I'm sorry, I know everybody's seen it a million times, but I think something like that will really help continue blending all of these colors. And I have one of those that I made back in the day and it's actually one of my most worn shawls. Like I generally don't have much use for like a small thing around my neck. I like really big shawls. And so something like that is is the plan for this. I think that will be a really nice use of this yarn. And also my spinning isn't the most consistent. So something that's garter stitch will sort of help to, to cover that up, make it seem a little bit more consistent across the project. So that is everything that I have for you today. Thank you so much for being here and I will see you next time. Bye.